What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barry, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind being a college coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a young and bright assistant coach with a great basketball mind, an excellent talent evaluator, and a future head coach in this business, in my opinion. And he's a native of St. Paul, Minnesota, Gamali Uh Now, he, uh, I'm read a little bit about his uh, bio, uh, you know, very interesting. He uh, played at Minnesota State. Um, he graduated in 05. I mean, I'm sorry, he finished playing in 05. And then once he finished playing, he decided to go the pro route, uh, you know, play for the Toledo Ice and the ABA for a year before returning back to school to make sure he finished up his degree. Um, he finished his degree in 07 uh, at um, Minnesota State. And then he also was coaching at Tartan High School at the same time as he was finishing up his degree. So he was, you know, I mean, juggling basketball still and, and um, you know, being a student was uh, still what he was doing. So probably something he had been used to for the last few years. And then he was also working with um, uh, 43 Hoops Basketball, who uh, Chris Carr had started that uh, in Minnesota. I remember watching a lot of those teams back in the day as a coach. And he did development with uh, – with, with, he, he did more director and he's a trainer for them for three years. And then he also coached, uh, you know, high school again while he was uh, working, uh, worked at Brooklyn Center High School in the 08 09 season. Uh, before going to Minnesota State to his alma mater, first college coaching job uh, back at his alma mater. Um, and then for one year after that in 2010, 2011, he goes to Concordia College. Uh, all while he's having success at these places, did a tremendous job at both stops. And then he goes to the University of North Dakota uh, from 2011 to 2014, where they also had a great run in 2011 and 2014 before heading to where he's now. He's been there the last six years at University of South Dakota. He spent six years there now, getting ready to go on year seven, where they're doing a, a tremendous job there as well. And like I said, one of the, the young, and I say young, uh, he's kind of caught in between, between being in the business for a while, um, you know, but still at an age where, you know, you still consider him young. I want to welcome to the show, Gomley. Um, uh, I mean, how you doing, man? Doing good, yourself. First of all, I want to appreciate you for letting me having me on here. So I'm excited to have this conversation with you. I'm glad you could come on, man. Um, and I watched it a little bit. Like this pandemic has been good because you can sit back and listen to a lot of coaches, and it's interesting some of the stories people tell. So, and I got caught one of yours, and and just thought it would be great for you to come on and kind of share your story a little bit and. So, so, the, so now everyone gets to know you. I, I mean, it's interesting because I look back at some pictures um, and I remember seeing you on the road. I do remember seeing you on the road a lot now when I was coaching, especially on the East Coast when I was at those prep school tournaments and stuff. And I, right. I just remember that. And you, in, in, this, in our business, we don't, if, usually if you don't know someone, you speak, right. but you don't really talk to them. You right. know? <laughs> so, you know, this gives you a chance to now get to know some people. So, man, we're going to jump right into it. We're going to go ahead and get unmasked. And one, and one of the first questions I love to ask is, like, we all know this in college coaching. There's no handbook to being a college coach. Right. Like, tell me about that first day, first week, first month, you know, after things are done with human resources or orientation. And you can talk about any one of your experiences when you were at Minnesota State, with Concordia, even North Dakota, South Dakota. Like, talk about that, like, especially when no one gives you direction. You kind of just thrown right. into the fire. Talk right. about that, man. Right. Well, I'll say I'm kind of fortunate enough that going back to my alma mater, I was kind of shown the ropes a little bit. Uh, Matt Morgan Taylor, I think is a Hall of Fame head coach. I was part of that class that kind of helped flip that program around. Uh, but when I went back to be a, I was essentially, when I went back there, I was a, essentially a GA volunteer coach there. And uh, that's kind of where I learned uh, the ropes of the college coaching business. And then when I went to Concordia College, which is a Division three school, that was kind of my first full-time job there. And like you said, once I kind of turned all my paperwork stuff in, 
and sat down with coach, Coach Glass, Rich Glass, is another Hall of Fame coach. He's a guy that kind of mentored Greg McDermott, Ben Jacobson, uh, two future Hall of Fame coaches, one's in the Big East, one's in the Missouri Valley. Um, so after kind of getting all that stuff turned in, his, his thing was like, hey, listen, I need you to recruit. Uh, I need you to watch film. And if I have a question in, in regards to games, I want you to be able to answer it. But I need you to recruit. Again, this is Division Three at the time, no rules, you know what I mean? And, and so I was like, okay. And so once I got kind of thrown to the wolves, I was like, all right, well, I know these areas. Let's go back and just kind of tackle that area. And I think what really probably helped me, especially when it comes to recruiting and, and all of that stuff, is my time at 43 Hoops being the director, uh, putting teams together for our club kind of helped me navigate on how to put a team together because that was kind of my job when I was the AAU director and putting teams together and that type of stuff. So I think that really helped me. And then um, when I got to North Dakota, that's probably when I really got the awakening of what the Vision One lifestyle was because it was like, all right, here's your stuff. All right, we got workouts, we got this, we got that. And I was just like, whoa, okay, like what? You know, but uh, it was uh, thrown to a fire for sure. I feel like I'm still thrown to a fire even though I've been in a little bit. Uh, but each each season brings something new and you kind of just try to solve problems as you go along. Awesome, man. Um, so you talked about recruiting, and this is what people don't realize. It's the lifeline of college athletics. Yep. You have to get good players. Yep. You want to get good people if yep. you want to win, if you want to yep. win games. That's just, I mean, you know, like you don't want to have a, 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 a great kid who just happens to be an okay basketball player. I mean, that, you, you like those kids, but you don't, right. you're not winning with those kids a lot right. of times. It's just, you know, that's, that's the nature of this business. But talk about your best and worst recruiting story, or, I mean, it could have been one where you were traveling. It could have been, you know, like you yeah. thought you was in on a kid or right. was it? But talk about in any situation that dealing right. with recruiting, your best and worst recruiting story. Right. Now, that's a great question. Um, I've been fortunate enough. I've, I've signed some good players. I've signed some good role players. I've signed an all-star. I've signed a guy that wasn't very good at, at a lot of my spots. Um, but I think the one significant sign I had that I think has kind of helped propel my career a little bit that I talked about, which I still think is probably one of my best signings to date, is a guy named Quentin Hooker, uh, point guard from Minnesota. Um, what's unique about his situation was you know, he's come from a great family, mom and dad, um, great family, and kind of kid that's kind of a blue chipper, work hard, and kind of undervalued for what he does. He was a six foot guard, just tough, knows how to play. But when I was recruiting him, and again, I was fortunate that when I was working at 43 Hoops, I kind of already had a relationship with the kid. And so I kind of knew what he was all about. But then when I got on this side, I kind of really started to understand, like, oh, now I understand how you evaluate why some guys aren't recruited because you may not have a scholarship for that position, yada, yada, yada. And so I was fortunate enough that I already had a relationship with him. But going through that process, he played for Howard Pulley, EYBL team, had a ton of success. And on the team, his, going into his senior year, that junior summer, he was playing – with a guy named Tyus Jones, who was now playing for the Memphis Grizzlies, right? Played at Duke, won a national championship, most outstanding player. And obviously, Tyus Jones was the attraction, but Quentin Hooker was kind of the guy that was kind of just doing all the dirty work on that team. But when you're watching that team, he's like, man, who's this six-foot guard that's kind of playing the two, three, sometimes playing four? And you look at him, you're like, man, this kid can't play. Like, He's an undersized wing because obviously the pro is running the point guard spot. But again, you know, I think that's the not knowing and again, being in the business a little bit longer now, understanding not everyone truly evaluates. That's why I think it's important that you watch kids in multiple settings. So I was fortunate enough to see him in the AAU setting and see him in his high school setting. His high school setting, he was the dude. He is a guy that balls in his hands. And you can see him control a team, orchestrate a team. I'm like, man, this kid's really good. 
So, you know, I get involved in the process and build the relationship with the family, uh, get the head coach to get out there and see him. And, you know, at this time, you know, we were just finishing when I was at North Dakota, trend, finishing our transition into the Division One, And um, he, his senior year, brings his team who never been in state, gets him to a state tournament, and gets him to a championship game. Again, he ends up losing to Tyus Jones, who's an NBA, in the state championship game. But so that year was the same year Florida Gulf Coast had Lob City. Um, Northern Iowa, I think this came off a Sweet 16 run or, or was in the tournament. Uh, so there was a lot of buzz around some of the teams that were recruiting him. But I was in so deep with the kid and built such a great relationship. And I painted a kind of a good vision for him of what his career would look like. Um, and I kind of told him, like, listen, if you come to North Dakota, you're going to be a guy that will be able to um, kind of be the mayor of the city of Grand Forks, North Dakota, because once you take this team to the NCAA tournament, which has never been done before, and you'll lead and, and do what you've always done, you'll go down in the history books. He's like, man. So he, he, he's a kid that is wired different, kind of loves the challenge. And because of that challenge and that relationship, he kind of bought into our vision. And so what's funny is our head coach, obviously most head coaches, they don't get to see the kids we recruit that often, right? Because during the season, they're locked into the team. So granted, he saw him and he validated it. He's like, yeah, we want this kid. But he didn't really see how good he was. And he was, he was excited that we got him, but was like, hey, like he's a six-foot guard. I don't know how well he shoot. I'll be happy if he can average, you know, eight a game for us and be able to play for four straight years. And I was like, coach, I don't think you understand who we just got. Like, again, going back to his high school, he took his team to the state tournament. He ended up winning Mr. Basketball that year. And – Everyone that's won Mr. Basketball in the state of South Dakota has either played at a mid or a high major level. And he came to us at North Dakota that just finished the transition. And so I was like ecstatic, like, yes, I got my guy, you know, and then he goes in there, he goes to North Dakota and he's a two-time mid-major player of the year, Louisville Henson All Award winner. Um, I think he led the team in scoring for however many years, for at least the last two years, averaging 20 a game, led the team in assists. Um, and again, his senior year, he brings that team to the NCAA tournament. And he, you know, they should have beat Arizona that year. And I'll never forget watching a post, post uh, the press conference after the game and Sean Miller talking about how Quentin Hooker could easily play at Arizona, like he was that good. Yeah. Um, and to kind of tie the story back, I know when I doing the recruiting president, listen, if you get this team to NCAA tournament, man, you'll go down as the best player ever in history. They'll be doing billboards about you. And so one day I'm going back to the Twin Cities to do some recruiting. And sure enough, I'm on the freeway and there's this big North Dakota sign and his pictures plastered all over it. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. So I take a picture of it and I snapped it to him, sent it to him, I'm like, man, I remember this story when I was telling you in the recruiting process how they'll build billboards about you. I wasn't lying, and he just started laughing. But that's one of the great success stories, this, and, and make you understand of how you truly have to evaluate each kid in a lot of different settings to know what you're getting as a player. And so the reason why the AU study was so good to analyze, because one, he was playing with the pro, so you can understand he knows how to establish a role and play a role on the team and then you watch him play his high school team where he is the guy and you see what he's able to do and so those are the two kind of things that you have to kind of put together when you're evaluating players and then assess what your team needs and he was a natural born leader and so that's what he came to our program at North Dakota to to assess and, and it was no surprise that they won right so that that is one of the greatest I love that kid still to this day. I mean, I've been to his wedding. He's getting ready to have a kid. He's still playing professional overseas. Like, phenomenal kid. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, go ahead. All right. And you said you want a bad one, right? Yeah, it could be. Yeah. It'll kind of in between. All right. So, 
um, especially now, right? Like between this pandemic, everything we're doing, we have to watch online. And I've never been a fan of just watching kids straight online because you can make a ton of mistakes. Because there's just some things online that you can't see in person, like body language, right? When the coach is chewing them out, is he looking at the coach or is he staring at the floor? How is he interacting with his teammates? When he's not playing well, which is, you know, there's a certain thing that you can't see online that you can see in person. And so I know the one mistake, and I, I will never make it again, is, again, going back to North Dakota, um, I recruited a kid who was an all-league JUCO player, right? I think he was a first-team all-league guy. I think he was a third-team JUCO All-American. And again, and this is, we went through the transition. Quentin Hooker is now on our team. I need a big, this kid was a big kid. And I'm like, man, I got this kid. This kid's going to be a steal. Again, six, seven, kind of broad shoulders, long arms. I'm like, man, we're getting a steal. And so I was averaging a double-double at his JUCO. And I'm like, man, this kid's going to be really, really good, man. I'm like, I'm putting this team together. It's feeling good. And then sure enough, the kicker was he needed credits to graduate in the summer to get there. And, you know, like, that's not uncommon sometimes to get some kids that need some summer work. But what I didn't realize is he needed 12 credits, which – it's hard to get a kid 12 credits in the summertime. It's usually six, right? He needed a full term in the summer. So we busted our tail. We got him done. And I didn't realize this. Well, I know now, like, how much work I had to put in to get him to understand the importance of academics and going through to get his class stuff. That should have been my trigger that I was working way harder than he was to get to even get him eligible to get there. And so we get him eligible. He comes to North Dakota, and I'm like, listen, um, we got you here. We got you graduated, right? We spent enough time in the class. Now there's a ton of resources here for you. Like, there's no reason why you should mess this up. We have a, a tutor. We have all these resources. You should have success. I'm still going to be on you, but, like, you're a junior. Like, you kind of got to mature and grow up a little bit. And so – you know, fast forward, we're checking his classes, coach, I'm good. He's not doing the grace in the classroom again. You know, like, you know, you run him in practice, you missed assignment, you set him a game, and we're going back and forth. I'm like, man, this is like, this kid does not understand their points of academics. I'm like, dude, like, you have to pass, um, you know, your six credits this semester so you can be eligible for second semester. Like, you, you're not just going to be able to think you're just going to weasel your way through at the end last minute to get eligible. Man, sure enough, texting me, oh, you got this done. You got this done. Yeah, coach, I got it. I got it. I got it. And last day of class, coach, man, I don't know if I'm going to pass these classes. I'm like, what do you mean you're not going to pass? Like, I've been on you this entire time. You said you've been getting help, you know. And you know how it is. Like, teachers can't really – as a coach and the FERPA rules and all that stuff, they're not going to give you, they can tell you he's not doing well and we can kind of be on the kid to make sure he gets it done, but they're not going to tell us the actual grade and whatever. So the kid goes ineligible and I'm just like, damn it. Like I was so pissed. Cause you, I, mean, I remember telling my wife just how much I spent work on this kid to get him eligible, staying on him during the fall and just to get and the kid was extremely talented, but he just didn't have the mindset to understand the, rec the work ethic that's going to take to have success at the collegiate level. Um, again, most of these kids now, they're extremely pampered, and right rightfully so, but at the end of the day, you still need that work ethic, which couldn't have, right? You understand the work that needed to be successful, or this kid didn't. And so after that, I'm like, man, I will never – take a JUCO kid that needs more than six credits ever again, because that experience, never do it again. So he was for sure the worst that always sticks in my head. Lesson learned, man. That's yeah. lesson learned. That's what you take. Like, um, like, I say this too. 
like people don't realize how this how this we always don't look at it as a job because it's a right. passion. So, right. but like you do give up a lot of stuff or sacrifice a lot of stuff. You, you know, you work basically 12, 15 hour days. Yeah. You don't, you know, you don't realize it because it goes by so fast. Right. You work 355, 360 days a year. Even yeah. when you go on vacation with your family, right. you got to kind of sneak the phone <laughs> to try to talk. To try to set up yeah. campus visits and yeah. you know you can't really like you can't never really put your phone down. You walk no. in that, you leave out the house in the morning, yeah. you're on the phone. You yeah. come in the house at night, you know you're on the phone. Yeah. Like what did you have to give up or sacrifice achieving your current level of success? Oh wow, um, you know the one thing I'll say I probably sacrificed a lot is. You know, we all have friends prior to getting into the coaching profession, right? And your your friends that have that are in the business sector or education or whatever, they usually have their summers off or their normal work their workflow was eight to five and work doesn't come home with them. So they can go out and have dinner, can go out at night or whatever. Where for us, you know, it's like like you said, the job was three sixty five all year round. And I think what I really realized is just the, the friendships I had prior to getting in aren't nearly the same as they were now that I am in, right? Like some of those guys are still talk to this day, but you know, they just, they're going out having this vacation and this, and you can't go cause man, I can't go in July, I'm going recruiting. Well, during the months between November and March, we're in the season. Like, I can't just pick up and leave to go to whatever. And the one thing I know I miss a ton of is all my friends' weddings. If it's not in August or May, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to go. And so those are, the, those are the things for sure that I know I extremely miss. Just some of those friendships I had prior to getting in the business. And then... The one that really I'm struggling with now, I'm married, I got four kids, and my kids are starting to grow a little bit older. Um, and my kids are now starting to get in activities and playing sports. And, and now it's like their activities and their games, I can't always be at their games because either they're playing when we're playing or we have practice when they're playing. And so you start to miss some of those activities that you like, dang, my kid's playing, I want to be there. And he's like, so it's a lot of sacrifice, especially with your family. So you got to have a wife that understands the business. And I've been fortunate my wife's a rock and, and understands it. And uh, I've been very fortunate that way. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, you you said all the right things. Because like that, that is that people don't understand. I, I, and I asked that question because I want these young people to yeah. understand. They talk about, I want to get in. And they think it's... They all they see is the shiny suits on TV sure. or at the game, and like, no, that's not no. college coaching. It's way more than that. They no. don't get that. So no. I'm glad you that's explained. The end that. product of the TV game. That's like when you can relax. It's like that's the test you're taking after you've done your practice and studying. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that. That's in the next question. What was scouting? We know that's a huge part, yeah. right? And it's like making sure your team is prepared. Yeah. You know, coaches trust, and, and different coaches have different philosophies, philosophies yeah. on scouting, so everybody's not the same. But at the end of the day, usually when it's your scout, it's your job to get your team prepared. You want right. to, you know, you want to, you don't want to give them too much information because it's like overload. Like right. they're not going to remember, but you give them enough. You right. know, you talk about personnel, you talk about right. you know actions. Sometimes you give them play calls. It's all different things, but then it's like um, there's also sometimes when. You know, you've given your best scout report, and you like, yep. you know, it's thorough. Kids still got to go and play. And you right. like, come on, guys. You know, right. or you on a scout report and you watch. You know, it's seven, eight games. Yep. You've watched the kids struggle for the last. You know, guy two for his last thirty from three. Right. Now he plays against you. Yes. Dude comes and makes three or four in a row. Coach yes. looking at you like, uh, I thought he couldn't <laughs> shoot. Coach, I didn't say that. I yep. said he's struggling. Yeah. Talk about your best and worst scouting report over the years. Yeah. Well, here's what I'm going to say. So I've been fortunate enough. I've worked for 
um, four different head coaches. Um, yeah, four different, just in my division one stuff. Um, and each coach does it differently, right? So not only is the stress on when you have the scout, but also doing it the way your coach wants it done, your head coach wanting it done. And so I'll never forget, you know, going kind of going back a little bit. When I was at Mankato, Minnesota State, as a volunteer, the, the third assistant there, who's now a, an NAI head coach, he was like, listen, I don't know if you'll ever do these, but I want you to go watch this game and do a scout on them. He's like, okay, what do I need to do? He's like, just watch it. You tell me personnel, their top five sets, their how they play defensively, and just bring it back to me. I'm like, okay, like, that shouldn't be too hard. So I come back, the celebrity report, and he's like, oh, that's pretty good. I'm like, now what? He's like, nothing. I just want to see what you would do. I'm like, okay. And so that was my first scout ever I'd done, right? But I didn't do any. I went to a Division three school. We didn't do scouting reports there. Like, again, he was a seasoned veteran who he can watch a game and just spit it out to you. All right, they do this, they do this, and just go on the floor and do it. He didn't have, like, a book report that, you know, we do at the Division one. So when I was there, we didn't do scouting reports. His, his thing to me was, like, hey, watch the game. So if I during the game, if I have a question, you can give me feedback. Right, so we're preparing. Like, okay, I can easily do that. So I'd watch a couple of games, take my mental notes, and you know. So I was like, man, this is a lot easy, right? You watch some games, you take a couple of notes, you go out to practice court and you just talk about it, and you're gonna go through it. And then I get to North Dakota, and I'll never forget. He's like, gee, you got the first scout, and it was Montana. Montana is a predominantly upper echelon team in the Big Sky gone to the tournament multiple years, won some games in the tournament. I'm like, okay. And he's like, well, what are you? He's like, it's your scout. Like, be, pre- be ready to prepare it and everything. I'm like, uh, okay. So I'm sweating. Like, dang, it's the first <laughs> Montana is really good. It was a home game. And it was just like, and that year we were there, like, again, it was our last year of the transition. So we had some anticipation of being pretty good. And so it's like, all right, well, so I've watched every game. You know how there's the first game of the year, too. They don't play many games. So you're trying to find film. You're watching stuff from last year, trying to figure out who are the new guys, trying to get film. So I just remember, like, pulling YouTube clips of some of the Juco kids, trying to get that in the, in the deal. And then at that time, too, like, we did all the film stuff in iMovie, like, trying to cut and paste. And I was like, man, this is a lot of work. And I'll just never forget just – the amount of time you go preparing and putting all the plays in and then talking to coach about it, having that back and forth dialogue about, okay, this is what I see. This is what I think you should guard it. I think here's a set that we can run to attack their pick and roll or these players. And here's like just going through that back and forth banter. And then you prepare it to the team. And then you kind of go through all that process. And then it's game day. And I'll never forget, like, you know, it's typical two day before game. You kind of go through all that. You feel pretty fair. I will never forget. It's like game day. So it was like, oh, my gosh. Like, we have to win this game. Like, I don't watch all this film, put all this stuff together. If we lose, I'm going to be pissed. Coach is going to kill me. It's my first scout. Like, I was nervous. I was sweating. I'm like, man, we got to win this damn game. And... It was kind of one of those deals where I'll never forget, like, I feel like we executed everything we kind of talked about kind of perfectly, and we ended up winning the game at home versus Montana. And they had Selzweig, who was a seven-footer, and we ended up winning that game. I can't remember what the score was, but I just remember the crowd going crazy, coach was super jacked, just because it's one of those measuring sticks, because at the time, North Dakota was going into the Big Sky, and that was kind of the cream of the crop of the Big Sky in Montana. And the one that game at home kind of set that platform for the University of North Dakota to kind of prove that they belong. But I just remember the, the anxiousness, the nervousness I felt of that first scout. Um, so, but this kind of the way we did it. And then when I came to South Dakota, especially when I was working uh, for Craig Smith, who did it completely different than my boss at North Dakota. And Craig is... You know, some coaches like, let's just cover the action and 
not necessarily, you know, the sets or whatever. Here are the main actions they run. So it's easier. You just break it down that way. Where Craig was like, nope, I want to know essentially the whole playbook. And I was like, you know, my confidence was rad of this, like, know the whole playbook. Like, what? He's like, gee, what are they doing versus zone? What's their press offense? What's their this? What's their, I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm used just to covering actions. <laughs> um, so just going through that process with just different styles of the way you do scouts, I think it's been a very it's an interesting process because there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just essentially your head coach's preference. And, you know, the longer you kind of start doing scouts, you kind of try to figure out which, which way you like doing scouts. But the most important thing, which I think people usually forget, is when you're doing scouts, you're doing scouts to make sure your players can remember what you're wanting to cover and go over so they know how to execute on the floor. And us coaches, we get in sometimes where we give them too much information and they can't handle it. Um, and then sometimes there's some teams you have, which I've been fortunate to be a part of, is you don't give your team enough information because they can handle it. So um, I think scouts, you got to kind of, you got to love watching film and you got to know your team to kind of know what you're delivering, how you're delivering it, and how your head coach wants it. Because as you know, Sometimes if you don't deliver the way your head coach wants it, sometimes those scouts will get taken away from you and you will never do another one. So <laughs> um, I've been fortunate enough that I've been able to do scouts everywhere I've been and coaches have appreciated how I've done it. And don't get me wrong, I've had my, my ups and downs with scouts and being rattled and losing confidence and doing it because after you lose a couple games, it's just like, what in the world is going on? You know, people looking at you and, so it's, yeah. That's great, inf great information though. And you know, you know who keep count more than anybody. You always, you know, you keep count on yourself. Yep. You competitive. Yeah. But the players keep count. Like they oh, know yeah. when you know what I'm saying. Like oh, yeah, they know. your scout or like they like, hey, coach, yeah. you haven't lost one this year. Or like, yo, you know, you got to win, right? Like, they know the players yep. know that stuff. You know, they do know, it's and the they, they they get they get a comfort level when. They understand, okay, man, coach told me to do this and it worked to the T. So, like, man, so they pick up on those things. And, and let's get all our players are smart. The kids that play for a long time are smart and high IQ. They start to understand. And, you know, the championship teams I've been a part of, they've always been player led teams. And when you're going through the kind of the game plan and the preparation with scouting, some of the players will tell you, coach, I like that, but I think this way could work better. And then you kind of have that back and forth to come up with the best game plan to help, um, you know, prepare the best way you can. So players definitely know. <laughs> I agree. I agree with you. Um, what's the biggest challenge, man, you think you've experienced since you've been in college coaching? Um, the biggest challenge I've experienced is when um, – when my previous boss here at South Dakota left and went to Utah State and then when the new coach came in and being the holdover. So I think that's kind of the biggest challenge I've probably ever faced in my career is because, especially when you're with the winning program and there's a change of staff, usually there's two ways coaches are getting hired because the coach was winning and left or the coach wasn't winning and they get fired. So you get a new coach. We were winning, and then we got a new coach. But every coach that comes over, they want to put their imprint in the program. And so I'll never forget uh, when we hired our current coach, Todd Lee, uh, who's a great coach, knows his stuff, super smart guy, um, very good coach. Just when he got here, I felt like it was my job as a holdover to kind of give him all the information to help him navigate and not – make the mistakes we did when we first got here. And so I remember him looking at me like, gee, like you're doing too much. Like you're, you know, he felt like I was kind of, I was trying to run the program. Like, no, I'm just trying to help you. He's like, just let me kind of figure this stuff out. Not realizing like every head coach has got to go through a process whenever they take over a job. 
And so that was probably for sure been my hardest time since in my profession is going through that experience of going from one coach to another in the same program uh, with the new coach. And then also with the players, right? Because, you know, some players are going to have their thoughts about, you know, one coach versus the other. One coach, one kid may have played more on the last coach, not playing under the new coach. And they're going to always gonna go to the coach that's been there that they know. So that has definitely been the hardest challenge I've ever experienced since in my profession is just being a holdover on a staff, dealing from one style of play to another, and then trying to navigate with the players and the new staff while you're at the same program. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. I'm glad, glad you, I mean, like you said, like at least, you know, he, he told you, let him figure it out. I mean, you yep. stepped back and like right. that's, that's perfect though. And, and, and he kept you on. So that's a right. blessing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this business is kind of interesting. Like we, we talked about it before, like how, you know, you walk into places. Some people always want to look at what's on your chest, yep. whether they speak to you or not talk to you or yeah, it's just interesting. But do you mm-hmm. ever find, find that there are things about you that people might misunderstand? Like what are they? Cause you know, like some guys talk about, oh, he just got in because of this. I mean, they not just saying, I mean, I'm thinking about you specifically now. I, I don't know if you've ever heard it or yeah. you like, might think what people, you know, might what they be thinking about you. But yeah. do you ever find that there are things about you that people misunderstand? Yeah. Um, I'm naturally a quiet guy by nature. And so I don't speak a lot when I'm around people, especially, especially when we're out recruiting. You know, I've always, and you'll be amazed when you go watch events and you see coaches. There's a lot of coaches that aren't watching the game. They're either on their phone, kind of texting, or they're sitting there talking to the next person behind them or next to them, and they're not watching the game. And I was always kind of taught to do your job. Like, you can socialize when you don't really have a game to watch, or, you know, then you can kind of network that way. But I was like, all right, do your job. So I would always go, when I'm at the gym, I'm watching games. And so, you know, a lot of people just don't know what I do. And plus the places I've been in the Dakotas where everywhere else in the country down South, out East, a lot of people don't even know we exist because we're in the Dakotas, right? And so it's just kind of create, just um, changing the narrative and, and, and doing your job without people viewing you like, man, that dude don't speak thinking you're arrogant or stuck up or just because I don't really speak because I'm trying to do my job, you know, but when people start to realize that you're trying to do your job and they actually like get to know you and ask a question like, Oh, this dude's really like locked in to what he's doing. Then people will kind of understand. But I think that's probably the biggest thing is because I don't really, when I'm on the road recruiting, like you said, you see me on the road, we'd say what's up, but it wasn't like we were half sitting there, you know, having major dialogue while games are playing. I'm like, I'm trying to, you know, again, again, for us too, like, we have to be very intentional on how we recruit and how we evaluate just because we're not a sexy name. So our list needs to be a lot bigger. So if we miss on A, B, and C, we can still go to D, E, and F to get the players that we think are good enough to come play for us so we can have success. So there's a lot more work when it comes to recruiting and evaluating players to give ourselves a chance to have success, which means you got to work. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Love it. I love that, man. I'm glad you definitely explained it that way so people will understand. Um, we all know that this is, at the end of the day, we get yeah, your coaches, but you're still educators, your yeah. teachers in this business. You know, you have some, you know, growing up, you've had some good coaches who, not, mm-hmm. not only just taught you basketball, but talked about the game of life. So what do you try to teach your players besides basketball? Yeah. Or educate them on? What would I, yeah. what I would say? Yeah. Um, I think the, the most important thing for me to understand, and I think it's something that was instilled in me when I was growing up, is just the importance of education. I'm probably like most, most kids. I don't love school. Right. It's boring, you know, especially with the way the world is going now with the whole racism and the reconstruction and just kind of understanding the history of our country. Education has never been my favorite thing. But 
I still understand the importance of getting a degree and how that can help you with your future. And I think now a lot of kids, when they get to college, you know, they just think that they're going to play ball the rest of their life. And it was like, at some point, the ball is going to stop dribbling. At some point, you're going to have to stop playing. And when you stop playing, what are you going to do next? And a lot of kids don't think about that aspect of life because they think they're going to be able to play basketball forever. And that's the thing that, you know, I think that when, kid, when I deal with the kids we have, I try to make sure they're thinking about that and like, what do you want to do? Are you starting thinking of ideas when you're done playing? I coach, man, I want to keep playing. Yeah, when you're done playing, when you're 30, when you're 40, what are you going to do? It's like, well, I don't know. It's like, well, we got to start thinking about that. We got to have some ideas of what your life looks like after basketball. And, you know, that's the thing that's kind of amazing and not to get super racial and all that stuff, but that's kind of, I think, the biggest difference between white kids, black kids, kids with two-parent homes, kids with single-parent homes, is just that foundation of education, the importance of it versus the lack of understanding the importance of education. And so that's the one thing I try to stress of, get a degree that's meaningful that you can use for the rest of your life versus coming to college. And don't get me wrong, all of us college coaches, we use our kids so we can win games because that's our job. But I tell our players, you have to make sure you use us as well to get what you need to get out the deal. Because if not, we'll just spit you out, we'll get a new crop in, and you're stuck, which is what you see a lot of kids when they're done playing, not knowing what to do. And that's kind of my biggest pet peeve. And we've been fortunate enough that most of the kids we've had have gone on and done some great things. Great answer, man. I love it. I love that. Um, what are your best and worst memories in coaching? I mean, you've been in it, you know, for a while now. So mm -hmm. what are your best and worst memories? Um, the worst, I hate the long road trips especially, um, you know, the bad travel, missed flights. You know, I, I, again, I've never been fortunate enough where we're flying charter everywhere. So you can go to a game and come back. So that's the one thing I hate because it, it goes back to what I said before, the sacrifice, you miss a lot of stuff with your family. And so the long road trips, even with recruiting, like I've never been in a place where, I can drive 20 minutes to see 10 kids, right? Every retreat trip I'm taking, I'm driving four or five hours at least to go watch 10 to three kids. So when you're doing that, you have to plan ahead of time. Okay, I'm gonna be gone these two, three days to go watch these 10 kids or whatever. And so that those are the things I probably hate the most is just how much time that we have to spend where we're located at as far as this with recruiting or travel um, to be able to have the success. And we've been fortunate enough that we've had success because we, we have a staff that works extremely hard. Um, but just after a while, you get tired, you know, when it, especially winter time, when it's snowy, freezing, you don't really want to go anywhere. It's like, man, it's freezing cold outside. It's just, I don't want to travel five hours the late night road trips coming back so you could be at practice at two, three o'clock in the morning. Those are things that, you know, have been the glitz and glamour that everyone doesn't see, you know, those things that I, I really hate, but it's part of the job. So you get, you get used to it, you know, um, the things that I love about the business, my favorite part of the business, it's, it's even being more in me now is just seeing, the kids when they first get to school with you you put the work in and whether it's games or stuff you've worked on and they, they start applying it to games and they see the growth and they're like oh coach that worked and the, the excitement on their face graduation day right most people when they come and graduate just the family's appreciation of what we've done and just you know life the relationships we have after basketball like those are kind of incremental of the favorite things about the profession, right? The, the long hours you spent with the kid, 
so they can perform in the game. And the stuff you work on, they perform in the game. You build a bond and a trust there. The graduation, you know, all the talks about what are you going to go to school for, that, you know, building them up to understand. And they're like, okay, they figure it out. And they either get a job in that field. And then this life after college, you know, the marriages, the weddings, the having kids, the coach, I need advice on what should I do now? Especially now, the biggest thing that I'm starting to help guys is financial literacy and connect them with people that way because they have now realized, okay, yeah, getting good jobs and making money and now understanding that lifestyle. So those are for sure my favorite, which makes the driving two, three o'clock in the morning worth it, knowing the reward on the other side. Awesome, awesome. Um, this, this is a little different. It goes off topic, but it's kind of – might laugh, like, laugh a little bit. What's the strangest thing, could be the weirdest, wildest thing a player has done outside of the basketball court? Like, you like, I just – I can't believe that happened. Or you don't have to say names, but it's like something yeah. like, I, I just can't believe that. <laughs> the weirdest, the wildest thing a kid has done. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. I'll have to really think about that one. Um, man, I've been fortunate. We've had some good kids that that haven't done anything really crazy, crazy. I mean, every kid has, you know, um, gotten in trouble with the law, drinking and driving, or underage drinking. I think that's kind of the norm in the college realm because, you know, when you go to college, that's you're figuring out your adult. You get you're on your own for the first time by yourself without mom and dad. So we're probably like every other program, underage drinking. Um, we haven't dealt with much. You know, I've been fortunate. We haven't had anything really crazy, crazy happen. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's man. a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I, I, I like asking this because it's interesting. Like, you know, you've seen enough coaches now. If you work for some good guys, and it doesn't yeah. work with or work for. Um, but if you had a chance to sit down with three guys and have lunch or dinner for yeah. a couple of hours, and it's yeah. like you want to pick their brain, yeah. this is you, like, I, like I said, I, I envision you. I think you got a chance yeah. uh, to be a head coach in this business. That, that's what I believe. But, like, if you want to sit down with three guys and just, you know, talk yeah. and like pick their brain like who would those three guys be there's a ton of guys in this business that's right. very good right but who would you pick just three guys that you right. just want to sit down three with? guys the first one for sure would be kenzo martin um i really like how he operates and obviously he's been at a lot of different spots and anytime his stuff gets on social media it always goes viral because he's always educating teaching um, his players, his teams are always good and competitive. Uh, he's never ever won the big game or, you know, got to a final four, but he's definitely making an impact in kids' lives. So trying to pick his brain on how he goes about making kid impact in kids' lives each and every day and what is his backstory and kind of just learn that process of how he goes about making that impact. Um, He's for sure number one. Uh, a guy that would, basketball-wise, Brad Stevens, I think he is a guy that's a, an extreme tactician who, um, you know, again, you've seen what he's done when he was at Butler, taking him to back-to-back championship games, Final Fours, and then now what he's doing with the Celtics, you can tell that his players trust him. I mean, Gordon Hayward, turn down a max deal at Utah to come to Boston to play for Brett. You know, the stuff like that. I think he plays a good style of basketball. Um, so he's for sure one. And then um, the last guy is a unique one. I love watching his teams play. It's probably Tom Izzo because he is, uh, you know, you look at him and you're like, man, this dude is letting his guys have it. He's screaming in their face. He's, you know, he's turning red all the time. He's kind of super intense. His teams are physical, tough, play hard. But I haven't heard 
one player, I mean, don't get me wrong, people transfer from his programs, but I've known a couple of guys that's played for him. I haven't heard one person say they don't like him. You know, so he does something about building relationships, kind of like Kunzo Martin, where I, I really like him because he, he has these ability to build relationships with players where they just trust them and go boss the wall for them to play completely hard for their guys or for them, for them as a head coach is what um, intrigues me. And I think all three of those guys is, I think what they have in common is they, they build unbelievable relationships. They get their kids to play hard and it's not all about basketball for them. Right. And that's the thing that I really um, look at. And that's kind of how I try to use our profession to make an impact on kids' lives through the game of basketball. And those three guys are for sure guys I try to look at. And if I could sit down with them, I would definitely ask. That's, that's a great group of guys right there. I, I really like that. And it's something you value. So that's even, that's yeah. even better. Um, and I asked, it's like, what's your favorite word or phrase that you might use, you know, around the players and stuff like that? Like, what, what's your favorite word or phrase? Yeah. Uh, there's time for everything. That is my, my deal. And uh, I need to trademark it now because kids don't understand just how fast college goes. And we all have those dog days in the middle of the season. We don't feel like practicing and it's not, you know, the dog days where it's hard, but again, you have to value time, right? Like I'm spending time away from my family. You're away from your family with wherever you're coming from. So each and every day, like you have to value the time you're putting in. And, um, and not only that, it's just the time you invest in yourself, the time you invest in your team, the time you invest in academics, you know, those things are going to help you have success later in life. And so there's time for everything, but you got to use your time wisely. And so that's kind of the phrase that I, that I would say I go with all the time. And obviously time means a lot for me. You know, it's not just the hours and the hands and the clock. What is time transforming, improving, motivating, empowering, right? So if you're transforming, that means you have an open mind. You're willing to learn and improve each and every day. If you're willing to improve each and every day, right, you're intentional about how you operate each and every day. And so when you're intentional about improving, you become self-motivated. And me and you both know the best players are always self-motivated. If you have to motivate them, they're not going to be the best player. So if they're, they have an open mind and want to transform and improve and transparent with themselves and they're, they want to improve and they're intentional about their improvement, they're self-motivated, then they attack each and every day with a passion, enthusiasm, effort, energy. And that thing is, that's empowering, right? So once you get those transform, improve, motivate, you start to empower other people, then when you're doing that, more people want to be around you because you're making a difference in people's lives. And so time for me is, is everything. <laughs> I like that. I like that, man. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Ooh, this is going to be good. Um, this is when I was, again, the very first job I got in Minnesota State Mankato. A guy named Lou Chapman from Milwaukee. He's not even in the business no more. He's kind of got in the private sector business. And we were at Coffeeville Community College in the back gym at the Juco Jamboree. And we're sitting there having a conversation. And he was like, gee, he's like, what's up? He's like, man, there's something about you. I think you're going to be in this business for a long time. But whatever you do, make sure you don't get yourself labeled as just a recruiter. And so I was like, at the time I didn't understand it, but he was talking about the, the conversations we're having now with the whole race issue and kind of the lack of black head coaches, just all of that and kind of the stereotype 
black coaches have in the profession is just recruiters. He's like, whatever you do, make sure you're not labeled as just a recruiter. Now, don't get me wrong. For me personally, I love putting a team together. So for me, I, I like the recruiting. It's not necessarily the recruiting, it's the evaluating of putting a team together, what pieces fit together. Um, but once you're able to put that team together, it's coaching them and building them and developing them to see what, what you bring together, how that works. So, you know, I'm not just a recruiter, I'm a basketball coach, right? I'm a developer of, of people, right? That's, that's my whole purpose. My whole purpose in this profession is to help young men go from young men to adults where they're successful men in society. And so, um, that's my job. So when he said, make sure you're not just labeled as a recruiter, 10 years later, I understand what that means now. <laughs> Where before I'm like, okay, but I like recruiting. He's like, no, 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 no. And I get it now, 10 years later. Uh, that's great, great advice right there. Um, and I, I like to ask this, like, what does success mean to you? What success means to me is seeing a kid come to college, go through college, and see them mature from the first day to last day to now being a functional member of society, having a plan of what they want to do with their life, graduate, get that degree, and then you can see that now they're intentional about how they operate and their purpose. They realize they have a purpose in life and that God's put them here on this earth for a specific reason and then helping them find that purpose. And so when we're able to do that, you can kind of see it. And then they start to understand like, oh man, like, you know, I'm moving in this way. You know, going back to Quentin Hooker, I was at his wedding and you can see this, how intentionally he is about how he operates, right? And I've been done coaching him for over four years now, five years. I shoot six. I coach him at North Dakota. And just seeing his maturation from him in high school to where he is now as a 25-year-old man who's married, just that is my favorite part. And that's what success looks like for me, seeing kids go from the start to the end and knowing that you've made a major impact in their life. Now, granted, during that process, we want to win some games too, <laughs> right? But I think if you have the right purpose in mind, right, you win with people first. And so the better people you have in your program, the people that you can turn them to allow them to be intentional about how they operate each and every day and put the time method to them. They will understand what you're teaching them and then they'll typically grow. And in that process, they're going to win a lot of games in that process. You know, and I've been fortunate enough. I've been coaching uh, 11 years, 10 full time. I've had four losing seasons. You know what I mean? And, and, I, I attribute a lot of that. Obviously, I work for great head coaches, but the thing that's been consistent across the board is we've had great people in our program. And obviously, all the kids we've had, most of them all want to play professionally, but they've understand by the time they're done what um, that's not all about basketball. And at the end of the day, basketball is going to stop dribbling. So what are you going to do after that? And so they... They understand that through that process. So that's what success looks like for me. That was kind of long-winded a little bit. <laughs> that was awesome. No, that was awesome. Um, like the way you broke it down. You, like, this is interesting. Like, I, I mean, I've, I've heard you on a Zoom. I've, you know, I've even heard you talk, you know, not just you telling your story, but like doing the Zoom. And I've also, you know, and today even resonates even more um, that you're a selfless person, and right. if you had, and, you, and you're not a self promoter, right. if you had to choose three adjectives to describe yourself, like which would you choose? What three adjectives would you choose? Wow. Um, I 
um, work ethic. I'd, I'd say I'd, people run to say I'm, I'm a hard worker. Uh, I would say a team first guy. I know it's not a, you know, I'm all about the team. And so I would say a team first guy. And even in our field, like within administration, different sports departments, like wherever school you're working at, all those head coaches, all the staff members, we all have to work together at the end of the day. So I would say for sure a team first guy, uh, which probably goes with selfless. Um, and then I would say patient. Uh, I'm a very patient guy. And I think in our profession, the way it's going now through this pandemic, through racism and, and everything else, I think patience is a virtue. And even when the season, you got to go through your process. Everything is a process. So you have to be patient to allow kids to grow, allow kids to make mistakes. Like patience is a part of all of that. And um, if you get kids patience and help them grow and discipline them, I think you can, kids will understand that they care, that you care about them. So, um, hardworking, team first guy, and patient. Would, would be, three, three good ones. I, I like it. I definitely, love, well, I actually love it. Um, I asked this question too, like what person or persons and or event has had the most influence on your life? Um, for sure, my parents, just because of, again, my parents being, I'm a first generation Ghanaian. I was the first, uh, I had like been born in the States and just kind of seeing uh, the process my dad went through coming to the state, United States and hearing his story and then bringing my mom over and then bringing my siblings over and just seeing, you know, my mom work 16 hour shifts, seeing my dad have a good job and then get laid off and then kind of from then navigate from different jobs to kind of make sure our families ends meet. And so for sure, my parents, I think that's where I get a lot of um, my work ethic and just appreciation for little things from. Um, they they built the foundation in me. Um, my high school coach, for sure, just from the standpoint of, you know, all of us kids at some point in life, we just, we think we know more than our parents, right? Like, we always talk about, ah, mom and dad don't know what you're talking about. And I feel like high school is that year where you're trying to explore who you are as a person. And my high school coach, who I still talk to today, Mark Klinsporn, um, kind of, not only did he validate what my parents were doing, he kind of um, showed it too. So I'll give you a funny story. You may have heard this already before, but when I was in high school, um, again, going back to the importance of education, I, I started on a team, we won state my junior year in high school, you know, in my high school career, I've lost seven games, right? I didn't play, bar I started playing varsity as a sophomore, my freshman year, we went undefeated, but so from sophomore to my senior year, I played varsity, was a key member on the team, a big role, yada, 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 but my senior year, we're, um, we're on our, our defensive, uh, defending our title. And I'll never forget that year. I'm kind of feeling myself, you know, hanging out with the girls and, you know, not really taking, paying attention to school. I was never a bad student, but I could have been way better. And um, I'll never forget when we were playing, we had a road trip down to Sumi High School in Denver Grove in Minnesota. Um, I was a starter and coach was like, listen, um, you know, get dressed or getting ready for warm ups. And my mom comes to the game, and meanwhile, my mom works nights, and so she values her sleep. And so, this is a road trip, it was about 20 minutes away from our from where we're from, our home gym. So, my mom drives to the game, I get all my gear on, I'm getting ready to go to warm ups, and then right before we go for warm up, coach, like, hey, gee, you're not playing tonight. I'm like, what? What do you mean I'm not playing tonight? I got your progress report back and you got to, you're missing an assignment. I'm like, what class? And I can't remember what class it was. 
if I remember I had to be in whatever class it was. So I'm like, coach, I got to be in that class. He's like, it doesn't matter. You didn't turn in this assignment. I'm like, coach, like it's one assignment. I had to be in a class. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And then, you know, as kids, we start trying to find other people to point the finger at and blame. I'm like, coach, there's another kid on a team that's failing a class. Like, it doesn't matter. Not understanding the difference of, you know, not comparing yourself. I, the, the phrase of, we treat everyone equally, but I, I treat everyone fairly, but not equally, right? And so I was like, hey, he's missing a bunch, but not understanding that he needed to play to keep him focused in school because if he wasn't playing, he would just forget about it. Not understand, I'm like, coach, man, I have to play. One, my mom's coming. So, like, my mom's coming to the game. If I don't play, my mom's going to kill me. Like, and if you've ever been on an African woman that you're, you know what I mean, like, she's not having it. I'm like, coach, I have to play. Like, I have to be in the class. It's, I'll make it up. Like, I'll get it turned in tomorrow. He's like, no, you're not playing. So, I was fuming. And I'll never forget you know, walking out there, change my clothes, go out there and sit down on the bench while the team's warming up. And my mom kind of is looking like, give me one of these, like, why are you sitting down? And I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble. And so she gets up, <laughs> walks over, and, she, and my coach kind of walks over and, and, and I see my coach and my mom talking. And I'm like, oh my God, this is not good. I'm just hoping like, hopefully she's talking to coach to let me play. And the next thing I know, my mom walks back and sits down. And then my coach doesn't say anything to me. So I'm just like, what is going on? We play the game, coach, you're riding with your mom. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> my mom let me have it in that car ride, boy. So ever since that day, man, I will never still to like that still haunts me. Like I'm turning in every assignment. <laughs> uh, so my high school coach just just validating what my parents already taught me. But not only that, but obviously my high school coach saw something in me that I didn't realize was in me. So him pushing me and not allowing me to settle for mediocrity, right? Pushing me to be the best I could be. Um so those two guys for sure. Chris Carr, who I worked for at 43 Hoops, was very instrumental in my start in the coaching profession because just obviously playing in the NBA for nine years, the Bulls, Celtics, Timberwolves, and obviously opened up 43 Hoops and working for him and just kind of learning the game, watching film with him. Um, you know, that was kind of – that's how I learned – coaching and developing and, and all of that stuff. And then um, when I got in the profession and coaching, I also have work for great coaches. Um, but Craig Smith, just kind of seeing how he runs a program and, and just how he operates each and every day has kind of been, you know, it's what's like, okay, I kind of learned how to run a program and, and those type of things. And so those are probably kind of went more than I need to, but those will be the guys kind of every step of my life of who's definitely molded me into uh, how I operate today. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, I always like to end of this question and it's uh, knowing what you know now, like what yeah. would you tell your younger self, your young self to prepare for as an assistant coach? As an assistant coach, um, I will definitely watch more film earlier in my career. <laughs> um, and the one thing that I wish I would have done earlier is I wish I would have wrote way more stuff down that you learned earlier. Like I'm starting to kind of accumulate all the stuff I'm learning now, the stuff that I like for myself. But all of our goal is to be one day be a head coach. And every coach you work for, there's going to be something they do that you can take and add to your next program and the next programs. And then whenever you are able to run your own program, like basketball is, basketball hasn't changed from when you played to when I played 
from the 70s to now, it's essentially the same game. Minor tweaks, but the concepts and the principles are still the same. It's just how you teach it. And I think I've worked for, from Brian Jones to Rich Glass to obviously Morgan Taylor Craig and now Todd. Working for every one of those guys, I've learned something that I wish in my earlier years, I wish I would have written down and kind of just kept a notebook or a file of things that I could always just go back to when there's a question or even now thinking about one day running my own program that I wish I would have had earlier, right? Like Brian Jones was a great offensive mind. We ran a bunch of pick and roll. I didn't write all the concepts and stuff down. I remember it, but I don't have the the nuts and bolts to, I just remember the finished product and what it's supposed to look like. But I'm like, dang, I wish I would have wrote what little drills or why we did certain things certain ways. So I would advise every young coach that's just now getting started or getting in, have a file or with, especially with technology now, just create a video file or a paper file or just a, a library for yourself of drills and sets and, um, you know, notes, quotes, and just a bunch of things that for when you are afforded the opportunity to run your own program one day that you can go back to this file to, you know, help yourself put your thoughts on paper, which will make it a lot easier. So that's the advice I'd give myself is whatever you like, keep a library of it. Awesome. Well, look, man, I want to thank you again for being a guest on the show and being unmasked. Is it anything you, before we go you want to leave with the people that, you know, that the viewers might want to hear just a little nugget or something? Right. Uh, I said before, there's time for everything. Um, and no matter what walk of life you're doing, your time is precious. And the people that are investing in you, the people you surround yourself are, are taking up part of your time. And if they're not adding to your life, you need to kind of reevaluate where you're spending your time at because every one of us is afforded 24 hours a day. And I know God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us on this planet. So you got to make sure you're spending your time wisely, investing your time and being intentional about where you're investing your time and being intentional with yourself to make an impact because we all have a platform and with whatever platform you're on, you, you have the fortitude of making a difference. And I'll leave this last story for you. So last week, um, our Vermilion Police Department asked me to kind of help. They were going through a diversity training with their police force. And they came to ask me to kind of speak and kind of help them give the black person perspective and how, what it's like when we get pulled over and all of that. And so we kind of went through all that. And it was a great learning experience just to kind of look from the cops lines they're just as scared as we are when we get pulled over because they have no idea who they're pulling over right and so and the one thing i told them is like listen just like a lot of people look up to basketball coaches because of our platform those cops have just as much of a platform as well but the problem is and not all cops are this way but how many times have in your communities cops are this there just to kind of be a part of the community and learn the community, build relationships with the community? They're not there. They always show up when something bad's happening. Now I had to remind them, like, listen, there's time for everything, and there's a reason why you guys are all cops. You guys have a platform. So use your platform to make a difference and not just use your platform just to do your job. You know what I mean? And so, and that, and that goes for everybody. Everyone has a platform, whether you work at Burger King, whether you work as a cop, whether you're a basketball coach, you have a platform. And depending on how you're spending your time and making a difference is what's going to lead to the impact you're making on the people around you, the people you're with, the people that you serve. So make sure you're spending your time wisely. I appreciate that story, man. And thanks for dropping that nugget. But yeah. also thank your wife and the kids for allowing you to spend yeah. some time with me today, man. I appreciate that. And I want to, yeah. um, you know, thank you viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guest as we get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe.